So my name is Kristen Knight. Um, I'm the professional coordinator, uh, development coordinator for the Schoenbaum Family Center. Uh, previously, I was in the classroom, an infant toddler classroom, mixed age for about 13 years. I also worked at a um, child care resource and referral agency in New York. Um, so did some work with mentoring teachers as well as trainings and CDA classes. And uh, this is Emily Manahan. Um, I am a teacher here at the A. Sophie Rogers School for Early Learning. I'm the master teacher in an infant toddler classroom. So as Kristen said, we have um, birth to three years old in our classroom. Um, and I'll be here to just give a little bit of input from the practic practitioner side, excuse me, um, what some of the stuff looks like in the classroom. And we thought it'd be nice to have some practical application of not just what it is, but how do we use what we know on a day-to-day -day basis. Feel free to ask questions, interrupt, um, anything you need to do during the presentation. I want it to be really comfortable and informal. Um, so feel free to get up, stand up if you need to move around, um, and ask questions at your own will. Um, so here, for those of you who uh, do not live here and um, are not familiar with this building, this is the Schoenbaum Family Center. Within the Schoenbaum Family Center, we have a couple of different entities. So upstairs here, we have the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research Practice, uh, Policy, excuse me. Um, and downstairs, um, we have the A. Sophie Rogers a. Sophie Rogers School for Early Learning. And then we also have community programs. Um, so there's a lot of different things happening here, but we all have the same mission. And the same mission is to improve the well-being of young children's lives through research, practice, and policy. So a little bit about downstairs, because I feel like that is um, a lot of what we're talking about today. So downstairs is um, the school for early learning and we have we serve a hundred children down there so we have children ranging from six weeks to almost six years they are kinder kin, that are kindergarten bound children and um, we have three preschool classrooms and then three uh, four infant toddler classrooms and in those classrooms they're all mixed age groups so um, we're going to give you some background information today mm -hmm. on learning um, and behavioral challenges, and Emily is gonna give that perspective from the practitioner point of view. So just to get us started, what our objectives are today is, as a group, I wanna kind of talk about discipline and what guidance and discipline mean. Sometimes that word has a negative connotation, and so um, I wanna get past that and work through what we think guidance and discipline is, and then we'll define that as a group and what kind of strategies we have used in our classrooms, We'll talk about the importance of having strong guidance and discipline policies and practices in your school um, or in um, your center. We'll discuss the long-term goals of the uh, approaches that we do use with young children. Um, in particular, then, we'll introduce you to the constructivist approach um, to guidance and discipline. And then in pieces of that constructivist approach, to guidance and discipline, we're gonna look at things like what's the root causes of behavior? So why are behaviors occurring? Um, what's, what's behind them? Because we don't wanna treat, um, we want to find out what the cause is and not just treat the symptoms of those behaviors. And then in addition, we're gonna look at things like the developmental effects or what I'm calling them developmental effects. What's happening with the particular children that you're working with in their physical development, in their emotional development, in their cognitive and language development, um, in their social and emotional development. What things are they going through? What touch points are they going through that affect their behaviors? And are they using those behaviors to communicate certain things to us? And then the last piece that we'll touch on is prevention strategies. So what things can you put into practice every single day in your classroom um, that can prevent behavior problems from even occurring? If you're staying with us tomorrow, then we're gonna go into some actual strategies in terms of you've tried all of these different prevention methods, um, but you're still seeing some guidance and discipline issues in the classroom. And then we'll give you some techniques that seem to work really well for us. But today we're gonna focus on what things that you can do beforehand. Okay, so um, let's start out with this question. How would you define um, the terms guidance and discipline? So if you wanna just think about that or talk, chat with the person next to you, 
um, about how, what you think the words guidance and discipline mean or what strategies or what things that you um, put into place with children come to mind when you hear the word discipline. Don't be shy. You can, it is a question. <laughs> yeah, so you can talk to the person next to you. You can just start saying stuff and I'll write it down or Emily can write it down. Um, I just want to kind of get your thoughts about what you think the word discipline means. Historically, it's had kind of a negative connotation. So um, does it still? What, what things come to mind when you hear that word? It's okay. Go ahead. Teaching appropriate behavior. Perfect. Modeling. Modeling. Learning. Learning. Routine. Routine? Mm-hmm. What else? Don't be shy. Stating expectations. Stating expectations. Natural consequences. Natural consequences. Positive redirection. Positive redirection. Anything else? No. Okay. Yell out if I missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, historically, this word kind of has a negative connotation to it. Um, often, you think about things like punishment or um, things that you put into place when children do something that adults don't like, right? Um, but today, I want to kind of talk about it. And already from your responses, it seems like your head is in the right place in the sense that um, discipline really means to teach to lead, to guide children's behavior. So we're gonna think about discipline in broader terms and I'll use those terms and Emily will use those terms interchangeably. So guidance and discipline go hand in hand. We're guiding children's behaviors. And the emphasis is really gonna be on the teaching piece of the guidance and discipline and not on just the stopping the behaviors from occurring. So yes, when there is a classroom management issue, you do have to stop that behavior. You do have to stop a child from hitting another child or biting another child um, or spitting or something like that. But we also need to teach alongside with it. Stopping isn't enough. So we're gonna use those words interchangeably and we're gonna talk about how we teach children through the strategies, um, prevention strategies, or how we guide children um, to teach them personal responsibility for their behavior. So your behaviors have a consequence. Um, and it's not just children, it's throughout life. Everything that you do affects somebody else or affects you and somebody else and has an effect on the environment. Um, so we want to guide them to take personal responsibility for their behavior and to be able to judge independently if an adult's not there from right and wrong and make good decisions on their own. So why are we talking about guidance and discipline? Why is it a hot topic? Why do people um, always want to hear about effective strategies in the classroom. So what the research shows us is that in terms of uh, teacher reports back to us is that many educators report that classroom discipline or behavior problems in the classroom is their greatest challenge. I think we all know as educators that children that do not have the social and emotional skills in the classroom to get along with others to have pro-social behaviors, to act positively with others, are the children who present the greatest challenges to us, not only with their behaviors, but academically as well. So when you're not functioning successfully, social and emotionally, with getting along with others and being friends and being in a group, you're also not as successful academically as well. So approximately 10 to 15% of typically developing preschool children have chronic mild to moderate levels of behavior problems. And those behavior problems that we're seeing in preschool age children or three-year-old ch three children or even two-year-old children in the classroom are predictive of later challenges. So those children that are exhibiting those behavior problems early on are gonna continue to to display those behaviors later on, even into adolescence. And if we're already saying that those behavior problems then are linked to academic, those children that are having a hard time getting along with others in preschool and having a hard time getting along with others as adolescents are also having a hard time in school. So that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. So 
people often say, well, I have all these things to do in the classroom and all these standards to meet, and I don't have time to teach children how to get along. I don't have time to teach social and emotional skills. Do, do we, are we able to give the time to do that? I don't think that we can not give the time to do that. Yes, ma'am. It does, and I think um, that's not necessarily a bad statement either. Um, the hope <laughs> and the expectation from us as teachers would be that they're also getting those positive educational experiences from their parents on how to behave appro appropriately or in socially acceptable ways. Um, however, the reality is they may have different expectations at home and at school with you, and most likely they are. As a parent, I know that I have different expectations at home. Sometimes I think to myself, oh yeah, they're jumping on the couch right now, and that's probably not good because they're not allowed to do that at school. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not like I intentionally do something like that, but the reality is as parent expectations, home expectations are different than school expectations. But also, with the way society works and having uh, dual income families or one parent, single parent that are working, you spend a lot of time with those children. And so it is your job to teach them and learn how to um, guide their behavior so that they're um, behaving in appropriate and socially acceptable ways. So with all that being said, it's important for us to keep this in mind. Early childhood contexts are unique. So how many of you all are working with preschool age children? How about infants and toddlers? Any school agers? School age? Okay. Um, so really all of this stuff is applicable across the board. I mean, you're, the things that we're going to talk about vary as the development changes, um, but they're all applicable whether you're working with children that are you know, two, two years old or 12 years old. Um, same kind of things are true. I mean, obviously with infants, you're not really disciplining <laughs> children that young, but um, all things that are good to keep in mind later when they become toddlers. So with the early childhood context, we just said, some people are working with infants and toddlers, some people are working with preschoolers, some people are working with um, school-aged children. So there's a wide variety of developmental needs. Is biting appropriate for an 18-month-old? Yes. Is it appropriate for a five-year-old? No. So always, 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 you need to consider the developmentally appropriateness of behaviors. So lots of things are happening from six weeks to six years, right? So things are constantly evolving, constantly changing. So there's a lot of different variations. Not every child walks at 12 months. Not every child talks at one year. Um, so there's a lot of individual variants, and then there's also a lot of variance in terms of developmental appropriateness. We can say biting is never appropriate. You're right, it's not. It's not acceptable, however, it's not desirable, however, it is absolutely appropriate um, developmentally for an 18-month-old, not for a five-year-old. So how you're going to respond to an 18-month-old is going to be very different than how you're going to respond to a five-year-old that just bit, bit somebody. So thinking about that and your interventions. So the supports and the strategies that you end up choosing need to be one linked to the cause, so what's causing the child to communicate in this way or behave in this way, and then it also needs to be developmentally appropriate. I always like to, um, jumping in, um, I feel like this is one of the best things to use as a teacher because when you're in it, it can be very easy when you're at, in a conflict with a child or you're trying to help them work through a situation it's very easy to get stuck on the things that you think they should be doing. Um, it's harder to take that step back and think about is what I'm asking them to do appropriate? Is it achievable for them or is it just something I want because I'm feeling stressed out? Is, is there another way or another expectation that I could have that um, will allow the child to be successful and will also allow my classroom to function the way it needs to. That's a good point. So what are you asking of children and does that expectation make sense for that specific child? 
Okay. So always, always, um, when you're teaching, we think about what our goals are. So I know that a lot of our teachers here, obviously being a, a previous teacher here, I know that what we do as a group is we sit down and we talk about what that particular child needs to work on, just in general, when we're creating curriculum. So what are our individual goals for John and Sally and Tommy? Here's the individual goals, here's the interests of the children, and um, we think about those goals before we create our curriculum. So before you plan what you're gonna teach, you clarify what your goals are. So ultimately, I want them to learn this, but I'm not gonna sit them down and directly instruct them on X, Y, and Z. Um, but I do have that goal in the back of my mind. Same thing's true with guidance and discipline. Um, so we always want to think about what our goals are before we choose strategies, or we've heard about a new strategy, we wanna try it. Does it meet our long-term goals? So these happen to be long-term goals that are in line with the constructivist approach. Um, and these happen to be long-term goals that we feel pretty strongly about here at the school. So one, positive self-concept. So always, always, when we're using any kind of guidance and discipline strategy um, or teaching in general, we never want children to feel bad about themselves. Shaming, blaming, um, making children feel bad about themselves in any way isn't helpful. Um, what we want to do is provide them with strategies that give them a positive self-esteem, a positive outlook on themselves. Um, so yes, they may have exhibited some behavior and it wasn't a good behavior in your eyes. However, that child is not bad. It was the behavior that was unacceptable, not the child that was unacceptable. So positive self-concept um, is a big one for us. Our kind of three rules or things that guide us are respect um, for yourself, others, and the environment. So you can't hurt yourself, you can't hurt your friends, and you can't hurt our school or you can't hurt our environment. Those are kind of the three rules and really everything else encompasses, goes in there. Um, you know, is it okay to throw a block across the room? No, because it falls under one of those three rules. Is it okay to hit a friend? No. Um, so those are when teachers are gonna kind of help problem solve or step in. Um, and then these last three kind of go in together. Obviously, it takes a long time to regulate your own behaviors. Mm -hmm. I know people in their 30s that <laughs> do not know how to regulate their behaviors. It's challenging. Um, and especially in times of conflict, there's a lot of emotion involved. And so it's really hard to sift through the emotions to come up with a way to solve the problem that's at hand. But ultimately our goal is, is we want children to be able to have self-regulation. We want them to be able to say, stop, I don't like that. It hurt my body. This, you know, then we want to explain to a friend, um, you know, why something was not okay and why it hurt. Similarly, we want, you know, children to have self-discipline. So to stop themselves before they initially hit somebody for a toy or just snatch a toy, um, to be able to think about that beforehand and for an adult not to have to step in and say, it looks like you want that toy, but so-and-so is using it. You can do this or this, or here's another truck. Before a teacher has to do that, we want, we want ultimately for children to be like, oh, I really want that Thomas the Train, um, but he's using it. So I'm just gonna go over here and pick this truck out and wait until he's done. Or I'm gonna go over there and tell him that I want that um, and that when he's done, he, if he could bring it over to me, something like that. So those are large goals <laughs> for young children, mm -hmm. um, but we have a role in helping them to get there. And then the last one is this concept of moral autonomy. And it's basically the same as self-discipline. Um, it's the ability to make decisions for oneself independent of reward or punishment. So independent of something, getting something from it, either um, a consequence from a teacher or a parent or something good for doing something good um, by taking relevant factors into account. So what that means is basically self-disciplining um, independent of anyone else, whether an adult is around, to know that they did something good. Um, and so that would be like, I'm gonna be kind to my friends because I respect my friends and I want them to feel good. Um, so it kind of takes on other people's perspectives, how other people might feel, um, and that feeling, you know, that makes you feel good morally and make ethical choices. One of the things that I thought I think of when I see this 
Um, it's also reminding um, ourselves as teachers that um, children need to have some conflict um, throughout their day or they won't learn from it. They won't be able to have that self-regulation, self-discipline. So if anytime there's a conflict, you're diving in and breaking it up or you're using all of the language that you have to um, resolve the conflict, you're not necessarily letting them work through those skills um, to be able to use in the future. We're really not letting them practice something that we want them to apply as they're older. So if it's not developmentally appropriate for our first grader to be throwing their body on the ground and kicking and screaming, have we done um, our job in early childhood education to let them work through and figure out how to regulate themselves, how to have that discipline and to know what they're looking for and is this a choice that I'm making because I'm wanting to be kind and wanting to have those, display those pro-social behaviors. So that's always good for me to think about there. Like, we have to let children have conflict and it's our job to support them in working through that, not just to stop conflict. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that goes back to what Emily's saying is to think about, one, you need to know your individual children. Um, and what they're capable of. We need to believe that they're capable of doing some of these things without stepping in immediately. But I think also as teachers you know, which children need a little bit more of my support in conflict resolution and which children can do it on their own to some extent. So kind of balancing when you're gonna step in and um, I think physical proximity is huge. Um, I think um, not just saying, hey, you can fight it out, um, I don't think Emily's saying that at all. <laughs> we want them to experience some conflict and work through solutions, and we will touch on negotiation strategies and the kind of strategies we use here. Um, but I think simply moving into a close proximity communicates something to children um, that, okay, I trust you, I, you got this, you're, uh, you're working through this and gonna try and come up with some solutions, but I'm right here, because if you can't do it, then I'm gonna step in and help you or guide your behavior. So earlier I talked about um, this idea of this constructivist approach. And basically, um, you know, the constructivist approach can be applied to a lot of things, not just guidance and discipline. It's kind of co-constructing knowledge together with children, um, uh, teachers and children working together. Um, it's about treating the cause and not the symptoms. Um, and dealing with the reasons why behaviors are occurring, because there is reasons why they're, beha they're behaving a certain way. Um, so effective approaches to guidance and discipline always do look at what that function is or what that cause of behavior is. Um, tomorrow, for those of, the, of you that are going to be with us, we're gonna kind of dive more into functions of behaviors um, and why children behave in certain ways. Um, but, you know, figuring out what the cause of a behavior or something like that is, can be difficult. You can't just do it by simply looking at it. Um, but with constructivism, we really just want to help children learn from their experiences, reflect on their experiences. Um, so with guidance and discipline, we want them to think for themselves, this is a desirable behavior, this is an undesirable behavior. I'm going to behave in this way um, because it's a socially acceptable behavior. And how we do that is we help children come up with solutions to problems. We problem solve with them. Um, and we teach them um, how to resolve their own conflicts. So again, it's like this co-construction of knowledge, not just telling children how to behave in a certain way, but why behave in a certain way. And these are kind of the central ideas to that approach. And um, we'll look kind of specifically at these kind of four things. So um, one of the central ideas is this idea of mutual respect. Um, so children need to respect teachers in order to listen to them, but teacher, children learn to respect adults when respect is modeled for them. So adults need to do the same thing for children. We need to communicate with them, act, um, in certain ways with them that communicates that we think they are capable and they are competent and that we respect them as people and valuable people in our community. Alongside the, the respect piece, 
Um, so a lot of times with respect, we uh, mutual respect, we talk um, downstairs with our students. They get really frustrated with guidance and discipline because initially they'll start like with a practicum in our classroom and um, they're you know observing the teachers and the teacher says it's not a choice to dump this out of the sensory table and here's why it's not a choice um, you know you can go ahead and try again and, and then the student then says the same thing to the child but the child doesn't listen to the student at all and so we always come back to this idea of mutual respect so you really have to create relationships with children before they begin listening with, to you um, so you create that relationship and they care about what you think and how you think about them so you create that relationship with them um, and create that mutual respect um, and then their behavior is reflected in that and the other key pieces are we want to help children understand. So we want, to underst we want them to understand not just that the behavior is unacceptable, but why it's unacceptable. You need to say more than stop running or I need for you to walk um, uh, would be a better way to phrase that. Um, why? They need to know why because it's not important to them if you can't tell them why. And if you can't figure out why you're setting that rule, <laughs> it's probably not a good rule. If there isn't a reason for guiding their behavior or disciplining them other than because that's what everybody says or that's what everybody mm -hmm. does or I don't know, then you should probably reassess whether or not that's an essential rule in your classroom. <laughs> Um, alongside that, age-appropriate choices and support. So choices are huge to this constructivist approach because children need to be given choices and control and some ability to make decisions in their lives. Um, we, give, as teachers, give children a lot of directives. We tell them what to do quite a bit, um, and we guide their day quite a bit, um, including sometimes when they go to the bathroom <laughs> in large groups. Um, so that's. You know, that's huge. We often tell them what to do and when to do it. And so they need to be able to have some ability to make some decisions and feel powerful and in control. And then finally, addressing the cause. So that's like a huge one that we're going to go into. Again, treating the cause and not just the symptoms of behavior. Oh. So I can talk a little bit about this slide because these are my kiddos in my classroom. Um, so we want to talk a bit about um, finding the root cause of a behavior. Kristen said it a couple times, but it's a great way to relate to it. Um, when you have a cold or um, you're sick, um, do you just want something that's going to stop you from coughing for a little bit? Or are you looking for something that's going to solve the problem? which initially is the cold, not the cough kind of idea. We're talking about the same thing when we're talking about challenging um, behaviors and guidance and discipline. Why is that child doing what they're doing? Um, so we have this picture over here of these lovely friends in, from my classroom. Um, and they're all working with one um, keyboard here. Um, so as beautiful and lovely as this picture is, um, this is kind of one of those environmental situations um, where I may not be setting them up um, for a positive interaction. Um, some of the things that you, you could see in the picture, some things where there might be some conflict in that. Um, and so breaking it down and really, finding, uh, <laughs> and really finding out the reason why something is happening is um, important. Yeah, so in this instance, which actually there was loveliness happening in the classroom <laughs> and nothing probably did occur, but so thinking about things like the environment, what's going on with their development, and are, are our expectations developmentally appropriate? In this instance, in one classroom that might absolutely be appropriate, and it was for Emily's classroom appropriate, but then there are other classrooms you bring in one guitar or one keyboard or one something, and you're setting those children up for an unsuccessful um, experience right there because chances are there is going to be conflict um, in turning things on and buttons, you know, something like that. So there's one material there. Um, so looking at, you know, is, is the um, problem or challenging behavior the fact that this little gal hit her or is the cause of the problem the fact that there weren't enough materials, our expectations weren't appropriate. Um, they, you know, there's something going on with development happening there. So hitting is absolutely 
a, a normal behavior for an 18 month old to communicate they want something. Um, but why are they hitting? So why did the behavior occur? Looking for patterns is, you know, it goes back to that early childhood contexts are unique. So specific children show certain patterns of behavior. If you know that a certain child targets a specific child, then look for those patterns of behavior so that you can prevent them beforehand. I always think about when I was a student at the lab school and we were located on campus, I remember them telling me a story about a little girl who um, often bit in the classroom. And what they, after doing a lot of observation, is she would go around and touch people's skin. And, um, and the squishier you were, she tended to target those children. <laughs> they, were, they, had a, they had a better piece of arm to bite <laughs> than the scrawny, <laughs> the scrawnier kids, um, naturally. Um, so they do exhibit certain patterns sometimes. If you know that a certain child sets off another child, then you know that child comes in with and is having a particularly hard day maybe keep them separated for a little while until you assess the situation and figure out what's going on that particular day so really knowing your children looking at those patterns of behavior and then thinking about is there an unmet need so we're going to go into like development pieces and break down into physical and emotional and social but is there an unmet need so when i think about unmet needs i'm thinking about things like attachment um, attention, acceptance. Is that child experiencing a lot of rejection in their life? Um, so thinking about when um, they're misbehaving or behaving in a challenging way, what does that child need to behave in more appropriate ways? What can you offer that child? What can you give that child to meet those needs so that they're behaving in more appropriate ways. So if it is a child who's experiencing a lot of rejection or doesn't get a lot of accepting behaviors, can you um, give them more positive, um, accepting, verbal you know, types of comments throughout the day to make them feel good about themselves? I kind of also was thinking about this picture. If you take a look, we have three, um, for my classroom, three older children and one younger child. So if the behavior ends up being that this child hit this child, it also taking into account things like their language skills are very different here. So while these two children might say, uh, in five minutes, can I play the keyboard? Oh no, two minutes feels better. They can have this conversation. She doesn't have those skills. So if she's verbalized or pushed a hand and she isn't getting any sort of reaction. She doesn't have those skills to then make a plan outside of it or do anything else. That hit was her way of communicating, I want that idea. So is that something that I'm going to be upset and scold her for when it's just her only way of making that connection or communication? So just a different way to look at it. Okay, so here's just a little scenario. Um, Carlos is using the yellow dump truck Betsy grabs it away, Carlos hits Betsy, and the battle's on. What do you think could be the cause there? So the reason why I left it very open-ended here is because any behavior can have multiple causes. And so, I mean, really, Carlos was using something, Betsy took it, and Carlos hits Betsy. Um, so what do you think the, the cause could be happening? What, what could be the cause? What's going on with Betsy? Okay. Yep. So it could be something cognitive or language development. Is it the um, only one? What's that? Is it the only one? Is it the only one? So is your environment setting children up for success? Do you have multiple toys um, that are similar? And even let's be honest, even when they're the same, they're not the same. <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're all yellow dump trucks. There is one spot on that dump truck that looks different to them. They know the difference. Um, but, you know, put your best foot forward. <laughs> um, what else could be happening? Betsy could be targeting Carlos throughout the day. Like, this may be happening multiple times throughout the day. Okay. It could be happening multiple times. Betsy could be targeting um, this particular child. They may have a dynamic that goes on between one another, um, you know, where they fight back and forth about most of the materials in the classroom. She actually have it first. Her knees need to paint, and she's taking it back. Okay, so did she actually have it first, and did he um, take it, and she's taking it back? 
did she have it 30 minutes ago? Because it's still hers <laughs> in her mind. Because cognitively, children can't perspective take. It's our job as um, the adults to give them those strategies that help them perspective take. Because the reality is, especially with toddlers and even some preschool children, um, if it was theirs before, if they want it, it's theirs, it's still mine. Um, I was using it before. So there's a lot of things going on cognitively there as well. So again, there could be multiple causes. So how would you respond if that situation happened in your classroom? Toya. Well, it depends. So <laughs> I guess it would, if it is, if I did not know if Betsy had it, I would say to, um, Betsy that it looks like Carlos was working with the truck. Would you like to make a plan with the truck or would you like to work with the other truck? Or if it was, she had it, she put it down, <coughs> she walked away. Betsy, I know that you had this truck a little bit ago, but remember when you put things down and walk away, you let your friends know that you're all done with it, but you can make a plan to get it back. Um, and then kind of okay, so helping them, what I'm hearing you say is, uh, one, I like that you said, it depends, because that's pretty much always the right answer. It depends, because it depends on the child, it depends on the context, and it depends where that child is developmentally. So it depends, you're right. Um, I heard some helping them conflict, resolve that conflict, um, negotiate some type of plan. Um, and um, also then validating and remind, I know that you had that before, and you really like that dump truck. Um, because you're validating her emotions. You really want that, and you had it before, and you can have it again. Um, and I think the other key thing when you're thinking about this type of situation, and this is more of an actual strategy, is um, in that moment, those children are both very heated, and they both want that toy. As an adult, you have got to take the toy and hold it while you're dealing with that conflict situation. Because if you let, con if you let Carlos hold that Trump dump truck while you're giving a message to Betsy, all she sees is he still has the dump truck and I'm not getting it. So you need to take control of the material or desirable object and let Carlos know, I'm gonna give this back to you. But first, um, you know, it's hard to hear anything that a teacher's saying if you don't kind of assess the situation and grab onto that. Yes, Maria. There's one scenario we didn't think about um, and I wouldn't know how to approach it, but I do wanna ask this question. What if it's a thing where Betsy doesn't know how to initiate play? She wants to play with Carlos, and that was her way of saying, I want to play with you. Okay. How would you approach that? So I'm going to break you guys up into like groups, and we're going to talk about social development, and part of that is going to be play initiation. So we'll talk about um, what is an appropriate way to enter play. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, the only thing I would also point out, I love the way that you said, like we talked about, you're acknowledging, um, you're helping bring them both down to a level where depending on where they're at developmentally, they could either have a conversation or at least have a calm body to realize. Um, the thing I would also make sure to do would be um, to acknowledge that even if it was just a little 18 month old swat at the other child, acknowledging that that hurt, um, checking on Betsy first and modeling that behavior of, oh, I see that Betsy's face looks so sad. I saw that you hit her. Let's check on Betsy and make sure she's okay. To acknowledge the fact that regardless of why it happened, you're still showing that child without shaming, without making them feel bad, without telling them they were bad, um, you're still acknowledging that it's not a choice to hit a friend regardless of what the um, initiating action was. So that's something that I would make sure to do in that situation too. Acknowledge that Betsy's probably and especially if you do work with infants and toddlers, this can be the world ending, um, you know, saddest moment, but it's okay that she's sad about that. She was still hit, so I would make sure to acknowledge that. And then, regardless of where Carlos is developmentally, whether it makes sense for him to go check on her um, on his own, or if he would need the guidance, then you're modeling it for him to show that whatever else happens, and whether it is, initiating play or whatever it is, this is not the way to do it. So I'm gonna model that idea and then have a talk about who gets the truck, you know. Perfect. Okay, so here's just some possible causes of inappropriate behavior and we're basically gonna kind of go through um, 
each one of these. So yes, it could be um, developmental. So it's something socially, emotionally, cognitive, language, something like that. Could be just an immaturity in development or they just haven't reached you know, a certain milestone. So it could be developmental. Um, are they testing out theories? Are they trying to figure out um, when I take the toy, this happens? We have lots of children in the infant toddler room um, that hit or take things simply to get a reaction. And it's not malicious in intent at all, but it's cause and effect. It's cognitive development there. If I pinch her, she screams loudly and I made that happen. I am having an effect on the world. I am having an effect on another person and that makes me feel powerful. Um, so it can be developmental. Um, are they experiencing different expectations at home and school? So we just talked about that a little bit ago about the jumping on the couch situation. Um, home and school are different and so expectations at home and school are different. Um, and even though children are quite resilient and quite adaptable, some of those behaviors go back and forth. Um, do they understand what rules we have? Um, are they developmentally appropriate rules? Are we clear about what our rules or our guidelines are in our classroom? Um, again, are they asserting themselves? Are they um, you know, looking for power? Are they looking to assert their independence? So that's kind of one of those unmet needs. A lot of children who dis uh, um, display some challenging behaviors have zero control in their life. Somebody makes decisions for them all the time. They don't get to make any choices. And so what happens is any time they can have a power struggle, they have a power struggle because they don't know what it's like to make a decision for themselves. They don't know what it's like to be able to have some power and control. So then when, you know, th those are your kiddos that often tantrum a lot <coughs> because they're trying to exert some power and independence um, in some way. Are they, you know, um, behaving in certain un unacceptable or socially unacceptable ways with other children because in the past they've been rejected so many times that now that's just the assumption. Well, regardless of what I do, they're going to tell me I can't play, so I'm just going to do it this way. Um, that's <coughs> absolutely an unmet need there. Has that behavior been modeled for them? Um, so are they imitating or copying an older sibling? Is there someone in the classroom that's having some severe behavior problems um, and they're seeing that and that child's getting attention for it and so they're not getting enough attention and so they think, oh, well, so-and-so gets lots of attention when she hits her friends, so I'm going to hit my friends too. Um, or have they been rewarded for that behavior? The classic example from rewarded behavior for me, um, when I was in the classroom, I had a little guy um, that had severe behavioral challenges and um, lots of hitting and biting and um, hurting teachers and profanity and those kind of things. There were, I mean, it was just down the line of behavior problems. Um, and even the briefest story time or circle time, it was on. Like hitting, hurting teachers, hurting other kids, um, anything that you could think of. And so what I would often do would say to the other teachers in the classroom was, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take him outside to throw a ball. We're gonna go for a walk. We're gonna do these kind of things. And I'd take him out of the classroom um, and it would just be him and I and then circle time or story time would go perfectly and lovely and then we'd come back and then we'd all go outside together. And what I didn't realize was I was giving him exactly what he wanted. <laughs> um, he didn't want to be a part of circle time. He hated circle time and story time. And he was very attached to me. So all in one, he said, I'm going to hit people during this time, and then she'll take me out of the room. I get her all to myself, and I also don't have to participate in story time. So I rewarded his behavior um, unknowingly, too. Um, so has their behavior been rewarded, or have they received some type of tangible item, um, even unintentionally in the past? I think that goes right along with, like, we know as teachers we are always trying to do what is best for that individual child, but also the best for our classroom in general. So when you're in it at the time, and I'm sure Kristen in that situation, she was just trying to do whatever she could to help that individual child and help her classroom at the same time. And I that, think that's where you get that feeling of, I'm in this and I don't know how to get out of it. I've tried, how, to, how many times do you hear that? I've tried everything, we've tried everything. And I think a lot of that can come from 100% good intentions and really not anything that's 
developmentally, developmentally inappropriate, um, the choice that she made, but it's so hard to step back and see for yourself that I was rewarding that behavior when you're in it. So that's why I think it's so important to break these down and look at some other things you can look at when what you know can work quickly is not making a long-term effect for a child or for your classroom. Yeah. Right. I, I did I did it for so long too. Like it was every day we had, you know, circle time or something. And then it didn't it didn't get into the point which we will talk about tomorrow if you are gonna be here tomorrow, um, until we started doing an ABC chart and, and started really looking at the functions of he had so many different behaviors and they had different functions, um, that we realized attention is his function of behavior. That is his unmet need. And boy did you walk right into that, Kristen. <laughs> Okay, so when, we, when I say developmental effects, I want you to think about the different domains, basically, the different areas of development. So what, um, what can we look at? What could be going on physically, emotionally, socially, cognitive? Um, I, I kind of lumped <laughs> language development in there with cognitive development. Um, so what things could be going on? What are they trying, what are children who are behaving in certain ways trying to communicate to us? Um, so what could be going on developmentally there? And so we're going to look at each one of those, but first um, we're just going to have you kind of get into groups or think about the age group that you work with. And um, sorry, all my stuff is on here. Um, if you want to grab the markers and the charts. Um, so maybe just kind of group together like a couple of people in each group. And we'll give you a, a flip chart paper and give you an area of development. And I just want you to think about what could be happening, you know, we'll do physical, emotional, cognitive, and social. So if you kind of just chat with the people around you, maybe you three turn around, you know, you four turn around with those three, um, and um, think about what could be going on in that child's development in that area, and we'll talk about each one of these. Um, so I'll give you like 10 minutes to discuss with your group. So the first one we're going to talk about is physical development. So when children are behaving in inappropriate ways or unacceptable ways, what things could be happening in their physical development? Do you guys want to explain the things that you came up with, or do you want me to just read it out? OK. Um, so what this group came up with was lack of sleep, um, nutrition or food, um, so we know that uh, if children don't come to school well rested and their belly's full or have an, a, 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 the ability to have a snack or something like that, um, then that can affect their behavior as well as their academic or, co you know, kind of cognitive development. Um, we need to be in a good place. You know how you feel when you're not feeling well and you still push through and you go to work. Um, same thing goes for children that come to school. Um, so if they're tired and they didn't sleep well or they didn't have breakfast because, um, you know, they woke up late and mom was rushing them out the door, we have to get to work on time, that kind of thing. Um, so nutrition, food, um, and rest is really important. Lack of exercise. So children need physical movement to function. Um, <laughs> adults need physical movement mm -hmm. to, to function. It's really difficult. That's why I said I want this to be informal. I want you to be able to get up whenever you need to. If you need to stand for a little while, go back and get a drink, move around freely. Um, because it's really hard to sit and listen, um, to take directions, and to sit in the same spot for a long time. Um, so they need some ability to move. Um, expectations in the classroom, sitting too long or not enough movement. Um, so the need for movement, same kind of thing. They need to physically move. So if you see kids fidgeting at circle time and everybody has completely lost attention, um, go ahead and cut the circle time off <laughs> before everybody starts hitting each other. <laughs> or, um, you know, come up with some things in your curriculum that support that. So um, can they do some kind of gross motor kind of things, some songs with jumping and moving and that kind of thing during that time? Um, are, do you have age appropriate expectations? Is the activity appropriate for the student? Um, Our example was like a fine motor skills, like asking them to cut something that, that maybe might be too difficult for them to cut. Yep. And so physically they're just not able to do that. 
So knowing child development and what appropriate expectations are, and that kind of goes with here, immature coordination. You guys have basically hit all of these. Immature coordination. Um, so gross motor, they're already like, I mean, my daughter is just about to turn five and she will literally be having a conversation with me and like <laughs> just falls. <laughs> and I'm like, how did, how did that happen? Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's just immature coordination in terms of gross motor and fine fiber motor. And what we know is that motor development develops outward. So all of these little things with your fingers develop mu much later than the things with your whole body. So they might be super skilled at, you know, running and jumping and skipping, but asking them to do things like scissors or beating can be really challenging. So keeping that in mind. And then individual expectations. So, yes, we might say, a three-year-old is able to bead, you know, pretty large beads. Um, but, you know, where is this child developmentally? Even though he's three, he might not be able to do it. He may not be there with, in terms of coordination. How can you adapt that? So, yes, you might have beads and pipe cleaners um, out in, you know, doing your fine motor activity. But that's pretty hard. Those pipe cleaners move and bend to, to do that beading type of activity. But can you give him something more structured like um, a, a bamboo skewer or something that's hard and isn't going to move on him? I always try to think of it in perspective of being an adult, too. Um, and thinking of if you told me that I had to sit still for two hours um, and work on some accounting, um, how long would it take me before I hit a level of frustration where I would just say, this is ridiculous, or I'm not doing it anymore? It's the same thing that's happening, happening with a child. If you ask them to sit and continue, and again, we've talked about there needs to be some conflict, there needs to be some things that they do have to work through, but once you hit a certain frustration point, there's no coming back from that. I'm not going to all of a sudden just pull myself up by my bootstraps at five years old and get back to that idea. You, you hit a certain point of frustration and then they're just going to act out because they are unable to be successful on what they're working towards and that's the only reaction they can have at that point. And then the other thing this group and I talked about was self-help expectations and are they physically appropriate for that child. So um, a lot of times routines, bathrooms, that kind of thing, those times of days um, is where you see some of your challenging behavior. So um, maybe it's because of a physical development issue. So maybe dressing and undressing is really difficult for that child. And even though the expectation would be that a five-year-old can go in and take care of his bathroom needs on his own, um, maybe that particular child can't. So be thinking about self-help expectations. All right, next group is uh, emotional development. Wow. All right, so this group for emotional development came up with um, a need for positive attention, um, not knowing how to initiate play, not knowing <coughs> roles. Um, I would argue that initiating play may be more social development than emotional development, but it could go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. it, people have a difficult time to like, they're so interwoven and connected that sometimes people separate social and emotional development and some people combine them, so I think that's fine. Um, power and control, huge. Probably one of the hugest ones for emotional development. Changes at home, the environment, or teachers. I would lump that with um, attachment, too. Um, symptoms related to abuse or neglect. Feelings of isolation or disconnection and reaching new milestones. Um, so a lot of these I, I have touched on as well. So reaching new milestones, um, what we know about young children is that when they are um, hitting milestones, oftentimes they're also involved in an emotional touch point as well. Um, so yes, we are two years old and we're developing some, you know, we're getting two-year-old molars and we're developing some new skills um, and hitting new milestones as a two-year-old in terms of language development and that kind of thing. But we also have the reemergence of separation anxiety and stranger anxiety. So they kind of go hand in hand sometimes. Big things are happening for that child and boy, that pro provokes a lot of anxiety and distress internally for children, um, which might then come out externally in their behaviors. Um, 
the need for positive attention, again, we talked about that in terms of, are they experiencing a lot of peer rejection? Or is there kind of a climate of acceptance in the classroom? So is the teacher really accepting? Are we modeling for other children how to be accepting of children who dis uh, display some of those challenging behaviors? Because it's really easy to have um, a child become a scapegoat in the classroom if they do exhibit some of those challenging behaviors, then children catch on pretty quickly to blame that child for things that they didn't even do. Um, so creating this culture of acceptance. Um, we talked about attention. Um, they need to know that they're getting positive attention um, and not just negative attention from behaviors. So one thing that we've kind of talked about um, with working and collaborating with Nationwide Children's Hospital is um, we give children a lot of directives. So go get your coat, put on your shoes, take it to your cubby, wash your hands, those kind of things. But not necessarily a lot of positive I like the way you got your friend's coat for them. You know, like, or I like the way that you're working really carefully on this idea. It's occasional, but not nearly as much as we direct children. Um, so kind of amping, uh, amping that up as well, too. So showing them positive attention in combination with those directives. And something, I think they said, you should be giving 10 positives to every one directive, is what they told us. Power control, again, children need that ability to feel independent and autonomous and that they have some control over their lives. Um, so your kiddos that do a lot of temper tantrums, your kiddos that shout no a lot, emotionally, those children need some control in their lives. Simplest choices help with those kind of behaviors. So you might not be able to choose between whether you have a home day or a school day today, but you can choose, um, you might not be able to choose, here's a better example, you might not be able to choose between wearing socks and not wearing socks with your shoes, but you can choose whether or not you can wear the purple socks or the white socks. Um, so it doesn't have to be huge major choices to make them feel powerful, um, just the slightest choice can be a great thing for them. Yeah, jumping in on that, sometimes we do a lot of that with um, plan making and our school. So things like the processy things that have to happen, you have to change diapers throughout the day in my classroom. There's no way around it. I couldn't just tell a parent, well, he chose he not to get his diaper changed today. So he's in the one from 7 a.m. That's, that's not a decision that the child can make. But does it really change my life that much if I say, um, Tavia, it's time for a diaper change. Would you like to change your diaper now or in five minutes? At the end of the day, the child is going to have their diaper change, but they're still having some control in that situation, and we're still completing the things we need to as a classroom. So I have not necessarily let a two-year-old dictate the day, like, well, he said we're not going outside, so we're not going outside. But I've let him have some, I've let the child have some control over the situation. Same thing as if we're walking to the door, um, instead of saying, stand up and walk to the door, you could say, oh, would you want to hop to the door or do you want to skip to the door? You're still giving them a choice, but you're accomplishing those things that you need to accomplish while still validating the child and letting them have some control in the situation. Yep. Um, attachment, I think you guys touched on that in terms of changes at home environment teachers. So. Um, you know, obviously we want children to be securely attached, but not all children are securely attached. And even children that are securely attached still exhibit some problem behaviors or challenging behaviors based on that attachment. Um, so they may behave in a certain way when their attachment figure is not there. Maybe one of their teachers have left. Maybe mom or dad moved out. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of things that can be going on um, that affect that attachment. And so making sure we create an environment and a space where children feel safe and secure um, will help with some of those emotional outbursts or problem behaviors. Um, and then the last one, or the first one on my list, is temperament. So for those of you who are familiar with temperament, you basically got three main types. You got the easy kiddos, the difficult kiddos, and the slow to warm up kiddos. Um, so your difficult, or as I like to refer to them since I have two of them, feisty <laughs> kiddos, um, 
are the ones that are much more kind of irregular and um, are maybe strong-willed or something like that. And so they might fight you back a little bit um, in terms of um, their behaviors, and it's just because they have really powerful personalities. Um, but I will say with that, your difficult or your feisty children can be some of the most powerful adults as well. Um, so even though I would never say that any of those personality types or temperaments um, are problematic. They're all just very different, but the way a child responds emotionally is much different. So um, you might have a child whose intensity of reaction whether they stubbed their toe or literally, you know, broke a leg is the exact same. Um, <laughs> so those are your feisty kiddos. Those intensity of your action is, it's, it's just major. Um, they, you know, don't really um, have a lot of self-regulation in terms of those emotional. So they need some practice with um, identifying emotions, matching emotions to certain things. Um, and how that makes them feel. I would also say that it's just as important to take into account your like your easygoing children because a lot of times those are the children that kind of um, I wouldn't not necessarily left behind, but if you have three of our feisty friends who you know everything is going to be a battle and you're working with them throughout the day, that child that's kind of e just easygoing, they may be feeling some of these regulations issues too they they know they probably know after a while that the other children are just going to be the ones that are having that attention um that are having those interactions um so sometimes you'll see that easygoing child act out out of nowhere and you'll wonder where it came from he's I, i've never seen him cry like this i've never seen him hit someone before whatever take a step back and think have you been doing the same um, validation that you're doing for those more difficult temperament <laughs> children for the easygoing child, they still need the same modeling as the other ones. They're just not going to outwardly show you that they need it. Yep. And then also impulse control. Um, I, I think that's just something developmentally that comes with time. So, yes. What, what, what do you do with those kids? What if you continue to, like, if they never acted out like that and then they started? Well, with, with temperament, I think the important piece of that is a goodness of fit. So you need to, your temperament isn't going to match every child in your classroom's temperament. But what's important is how do you reach those children? So some children are much more difficult to attach to than other children. Um, but you have to find something. They're not going to change at, as a two-year-old. To, to, to meet your fit of your temperament. So you need to figure out a way to, to match their temperament in some way, to meet their needs, to find something about that child that you can connect with emotionally to help them through that. And, I mean, temperament doesn't change with time. It's, it's something that's, it's, it's, it is what it is. If you are a feisty child, um, those, that temperament's gonna stay with you. But as an adult, we learn how to exhibit behaviors based on that temperament that are socially acceptable. Um, and, and feisty children have socially acceptable behaviors too. Um, I think it's just important to keep their temperament in mind when you see those types of behaviors happening in the classroom. Um, and then impulse control in terms of emotional development is something that it develops with time. But it's powerfully effective to hit somebody to get what you want because it works. You know what I mean? It takes somebody off guard and it gets you the toy that you want. And so it kind of positively reinforces that for them. Um, so with time, they realize, well, it's much more acceptable for me to say, I want that toy. Can I make a plan for that toy? Um, will you share that with me? Something like that. Rather than the gut reaction to come out swinging. Cognitive, back here. Okay, so retention skills, like memory, okay. Um, concept of time, large range of development, undiagnosed disabilities, communication, trauma, and sequential process. Okay, so I'll have you explain some of them so I can get your thought process on here too. Um, so communication, I'm sure we were thinking about the same things since I grouped language and cognitive together. 
So there may be a language delay. Um, there may not be. Um, in times of conflict situation, we tend to lose our ability to communicate. Um, because of the emotional link to it. So a lot of our children still in the preschool age will sign because you don't lose that motor skill of stop, um, but it's hard to communicate when you're worked up emotionally about a situation. Um, so they may not be able verbally to have the words, um, depending on the age or development, to be able to say, I want that, I want to make a plan, um, let's you know, resolve this conflict <laughs> um, like two adults. <laughs> um, so they may not have the language ability, so there may be a language delay. Um, egocentrism just means that um, what's mine is mine. I had it before. I have a hard time perspective taking, um, and knowing that other people have wants, needs, and desires that are different from my own. Um, so they um, have a certain view of the world and uh, really don't deviate from that. Um, and it's hard for them to understand that their teachers or their friends might want something different. Obviously, they have limited experience. They've been on this earth for a lot less longer <laughs> than we have. Um, and limited reasoning skills. Their cognitive development um, is also limited in experience. We're still, we're still developing co concepts of abstract thinking into adulthood. Um, so to expect a, a toddler or a four-year-old to do it would be a hard expectation. And with that also becomes uh, real in fantasy. So we see a lot of lying in preschool, um, and that can be a really hot button for people. It can be a hot button for parents. Um, it can be a hot button for teachers. Um, but really, they don't really understand the concept of lying cognitively. Um, if real in fantasy is very a blurred line for them, um, if they thought it happened, then it happened. If they want it to happen, then it happened. <laughs> um, I'll say sometimes to my five-year-old, did, did you do that on purpose or, or was it an accident? And she'll be like, it was an accident. And I'm like, it's always an accident. <laughs> they really want it to be an accident, but it's probably on purpose. Um, but they don't understand the concept of accident or on purpose. Um, they don't understand the concepts of lies or real versus fantasy. They're still kind of experimenting with that, um, what it means to lie to somebody and what the consequence is when you lie to somebody. Um, explain what do you mean by trauma? So um, basically trauma can very and shape your brain. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's going to affect everything, whether it's your memory, whether it's the way you see things in every area. Yep. Absolutely. It affects um, attachment. It affects emotional development, um, how you perceive situations or anticipate the way a situation is going to happen or um, the solution or the ending of a situation. Okay. How about um, uh, Uh, like memory, do you mean in terms of like the same thing happened before and we went worked through this, but yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Keep going, girl. <laughs> So repeated experiences are necessary. Um, and we need to remember that as teachers. Teaching something one time, 10 times, they need repeated multiple experiences with the same thing, with the same activity over and over again. It's fine to put something out multiple days in a row and teach the same concepts because they need multiple experiences with the same things or the same social and emotional skill if you're doing a social emotional curriculum or something like that. I always try to think of that when a lot of times as teachers just out of frustration you'll say something like I've given you this message six times today or I've uh, we've talked we talk about this every day before lunch it doesn't really mean anything to the child in that situation they're not going to go oh yeah you did say that six times I'm sorry you know, that, yeah, right. It, it, that's exactly it. We feel better saying and getting that frustration out of, I think this is the only thing I talked about today, and it's still not getting across. 
but that doesn't really mean anything to the child. So we have to expand it a little bit past what feels better for me to say. And trust me, there are those times where you just need to say, we all get that, we're all there. But thinking about that, just because this, maybe that is the sixth time that you said it today, maybe they only heard it twice, and the first time they ever had any concept of that was last week. They're changing so much of the time. So, so trying to avoid that, because um, that can turn into shaming really quick too. Are you really saying that because you want that child to trigger and remember, oh yeah, six times. Or are you saying that so that everybody hears, I told you this already six different times. You know, they don't have that experience. It's not helpful to add that on there. And it's hard to stop and think of that, that situation. But if you're modeling a positive reaction or if you're modeling what you expect out of them, it's a lot more effective than saying the, we talk about this every afternoon, kind of stuff like that. Yep. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. It's more of cognitive. What about those friends that are developmentally able to understand those things? You know, they know what they're doing is inappropriate. They know that I'm going to throw this ball in the head in the head. And I know I'm doing it. And I know what's going to happen when I do it. But they're going to keep doing it. Almost. I mean, I think there, there, is, a, there is a function behind <laughs> that behavior. Are, do they need some positive attention? Do they have some issues with impulse control? Um, does it make them feel powerful um, to hit another child, to have that effect on another person? Um, it, there's something going on. They're communicating something with that behavior. May not be cognitive development. It may be some other unmet need. All right, last group is the social development. All right, so um, initiating play. I have that on here too. Entering or initiating play. Um, enter, organize play, similar interests with other peers. Um, so initiating play is hard. It's a skill that we have to kind of teach children. And the interesting thing is, is you think that a child coming up to a group of children playing and saying, can I play, would be really effective. Like what a great skill he's using his words to say, can I play with you? Not powerfully effective for entering play or initiating play with other children. Because just like anything, if we say to a child, do we hit our friends? Yep. <laughs> you give them the ability to say yes or no to that question. So when a child thinks they're entering play in a positive way by saying, can I play on the monkey bars with you? No. You're, you're giving the other children the ability to, uh, to exert power and reject you as a peer. We don't really think about it because we always say like, well, just use your words. Um, you know, tell them you want to play, but it's really not an effective strategy to enter play because you're giving children the option to reject a peer. What's more effective is to first play near them, kind of observe their play, do some parallel play, and then just enter play naturally. Oh, it looks like they're building structures. I'm going to build a structure too, right next to them, and then just gradually enter play and say, I need a I need a bridge. What are you making? And then they ease into that play without interrupting the ongoing play that's happening. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, but truthfully, I mean, like you would think though, I, even when I was kind of just creating this, I'm like, I never really thought about that not saying, can I play with you? And how that opens up the door to rejection. And I observe it all the time, just in our neighborhood. I have, I have groups of friends in our neighborhood that have children who have never been in group care before. And they are the kiddos in our neighborhood that will say like, you have to be nice, you have to, you have to let me play dolls too, or you have to let me do this. Um, can I play with you? And every time somebody's crying because somebody's being left out. Um, and it's not malicious intent. Children are young and they're just, they're just being young. Um, but when you open the door to a yes or no question, um, chances are they're gonna say no. Um, because again, it goes back to that power and control idea. I always think about it, same thing, again, back to being an adult. If there's a group of people talking and you walk up and say, hello, can I talk to you? Yeah. You probably get an, or what are you talking about? Or you kind of, it's an uncomfortable situation then. It's like. <laughs> so it's just socially well, awkward. Certainly you can't. You know, but if you, in general, you'd think about that, you would hear somebody talking 
you listen to them for a minute and then you add something in and now you're part of the conversation. Um, That's a great example. But we're not necessarily expecting, we're expecting children, like Kristen said, to interrupt the play that was clearly an exciting situation enough to draw other people in, whatever it is, we're asking them to stop play, make a direct question, risk rejection, when that's not something that we expect ourselves to do as, as an adult, you would just naturally kind of enter that in. So it's, it's hard, like you said, it is a sophisticated skill. It's something that, and we all know adults that don't quite have that skill. You know? <laughs> um, so it, it is a, a complex skill and that's why that modeling of it is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't say things like, you have to share or you have to be nice to your friends. I don't get to say, Tavia, uh, in five minutes, I want your car. <laughs> you don't have to give me your car. You don't always have to share in that situation. So giving those, like, giving those really hard, you have to share, you have to be nice, you have to let him play, doesn't really allow them the room to have those natural social interactions. Now it's just another directive from yeah. a teacher. Perfect. Um, conflict resolution skills. Um, so that's connected here to like letting children experience conflict, like we talked about, letting them work through what a conflict looks like, what that, what that takes, some give and take exchanges, and experiencing the results of um, their conflicts. Um, missing social skills, so interacting in appropriate ways, like gentle touches and hugs, being around peers and groups, personality and temperament. Um, the other one was support from home, so modeling social skills and connecting home and school strategies. Um, so again, the perspective taking is part cognitive um, with, as far as egocentrism goes and being able to take on the perspectives, and then learning how to perspective take and what, what that means you know, to be empathetic to be sympathetic, to be able to take on the viewpoint of somebody else. So those are things that they're still developing. Um, and then I put in here too, socially accepted words versus social skills. Um, and Emily kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but social skills are something that it's important for us to teach. How to enter play appropriately, how to be a good friend, um, what it means to, to play cooperatively or in a group. Those are kind of skills that we want, um, the conflict resolution skills. Yes, we want children to be polite and use their manners and things like that, but that shouldn't be the focus of our social skills um, teaching. So using manners like please and thank you and I'm sorry and those kind of things, I think are best taught by modeling rather than it being like coerced or forced. So you all know the children that do something and then automatically say, I'm sorry, <laughs> because they think it's gonna fix what just happened. Um, and I think it's much better for us as teachers to model authentically what an apology looks like then use it as a, a, a fix to a situation. Yes, ma'am. Speaking of that, what are your thoughts on um, when kids, when someone, a kid does something to another one, making them say, I'm sorry? We do not do it here. Um, we do not force apologies. I'm kind of in the camp with um, modeling apologies. So like if you're in the classroom with another teacher and um, you step on their foot as you pass by and you say, oh, I'm so sorry, are you okay? Perfect example of modeling. Um, an authentic apology. When we force children to say I'm sorry, we are communicating to them that those two words have fixed or undid what they have done. Um, it doesn't really teach the child the effects of their behavior on another person. Um, I often say that as an adult to my spouse. I don't want you to say you're sorry. I just want you to stop doing that. <laughs> um, the same thing is true for children. Um, when you hit somebody that really hurts and look at their face and tell him how did that make you feel, much more valuable in terms of social skill development than hearing I'm sorry. So I'm sorry does not fix anything. It, for most kids, it doesn't make them feel better. There are some children though that will say, I want, him, I want him to say I'm sorry. And then we can negotiate whether or not that child will do it, if that's what makes them feel better. But I don't think forcing children to apologize is effective at all. I kind of think of that the same way with please and thank you. For a lot of the children, especially younger, um, or even in preschool, it's taken a lot of them to form whatever thought they were giving to you. It's taken a lot for them to say, instead of jumping up and grabbing more food off of the tray, it's taken a lot to say, I'd like some more chicken, or I want more chicken. So are we really gonna sit there and go, what's the magic word? Or 
make them say please in that situation because it's a, a socially acceptable word that I like. Is it really doing anything positive for the child in their, or in their interaction, or is it just a word that we generally like hearing? So being able to acknowledge, and that doesn't mean I can't model it. Then when I'm sitting with my co-teachers at um, lunch, I could say, oh, could you please pass me the salad? And they see that that's a kind interaction. It's a way that I use those words to get something that I want. But I feel like still acknowledging the fact that, these, that they're showing that regulation of not just taking something or um, making a follow-up comment. When you require that please and thank you, it's kind of discrediting all the work they did to put that thought together to control their body. And just same as I'm sorry, it just becomes about the word and not the action or the interaction. Yeah, and I think you can use those times too. Um, I'll get you in one sec. Um, to do that, that positive feedback and that acceptance. So when they do say, more milk please, then you can say, I heard you say that you wanted more milk and you did it in such a kind, polite way. That, that's a great way to match the directives with accepting positives as well. Mm -hmm. and they're just sort of barking out orders at you, what would you suggest? Like, I don't want to harp on the please or thank you either, but there's got to be a better way to... I think you can do, um, you can do some supportive strategies with language, and you could just say, um, even if it's not the please, you just want it to be less demanding. Right. Um, I think you could just say, um, you can say, more milk, or can I have more? Um, and model what, what, what is an appropriate strategy for you and go ahead and give that, those words to them and model it for them. Um, so if you're not saying that they have to say please for something um, or if they say more milk, um, you could say, I hear you saying more milk please, I'll be right over. And you can add that word to it to extend it. Um, but just try to kind of reinforce the words that they have but add on to it so that it has kind of more of a positive spin so it doesn't feel like they're demanding something from you um, <laughs> yeah, I also, um yeah i also think off of that too um we talked about um really amping up those times where another child is mm -hmm. is showing that so if Tavia is saying more milk more milk and i hear maria later saying can i have some more milk please i would go Oh, Maria, I heard you saying, can I have some more milk, please? Those were such kind words. Go ahead and put your cup down and I'll give you some milk. So we're modeling that. I, um, one of my co-teachers in my classroom is great about this with accidents and um, showing uh, a child really what an accident is. So, I mean, we do. I have spilled more uh, containers of milk in my life probably than any of these children have. Um, so when that happens, she, she'll say, oh, no. Uh, milk was in my hand and it fell down. I didn't mean for that to happen. That was an accident. And accidents happen all the time. So we're modeling that. We, we don't expect them to know, kind of backtracking the difference between uh, on purpose and an accident, but we are modeling. So I feel like there's so many natural times in the classroom where it doesn't have to be, we're sitting down to learn how to ask for more milk, where you can just model it. And, and children pick up, I mean, they they learn from their environment. That's how they do a lot of their learning. So they pick up on those things too, especially if it's effective, especially if right when I hear Maria use those really clear, kind words, I respond. Another child will, will notice then, like, oh, she got a quick reaction. They're getting what they want. Mm -hmm. Yep, just kind of saying like, oh, did, did you say that you wanted more milk? Uh, you know, yeah, I can get you more milk. You can say more milk, please, and then repeat it back to them in a socially acceptable way, how you would want it to be said. I think is, is completely fine. Let's go ahead and skip this and do the video. What do you think, there's a couple things going on there, but what do you think could be some of the unmet needs that we just talked about? There's clearly some kind of developmental delay happening. Um, what what type of development do you think? What area of development do you do you see that's frustrating him at this point? Physical, Physical development. Yep. So he's clearly working or has been working at putting on that shirt, 
or um, somebody was helping with the shirt and had got distracted and you know walked away um, and he is unable to get the shirt on by himself um, what else could be happening there language, language. Um, so she's signing to him um, and he's not you know you know obviously he wasn't over there saying I need help with my shirt I need help with my shirt so there's something going on with his language or cognitive development what else do you think could be why is he hitting himself too could else, what else could be happening, or how did that situation so end? Many calming strategies. He needed her to help him. Calm yep. Down. So he needed some kind of self-regulation in terms of emotional development. And what I kind of saw here was some positive. Just like that positive attention. He wanted positive attention. So um, you know, you see automatically the physical thing. He's clearly frustrated because he can't get a shirt on, and that's a physical development thing. Um, but at the end, like he really wanted her to hug him. He really wanted that like attention and acceptance. And we don't know <laughs> what his function is, but it could have been any one of those unmet needs, or it could have been the function of his behavior. It could have been attention. He could have been harming himself in order to get the teacher's attention, but was unable to say, I need your help, or I want you to come over here, or something like that. Um, so the next thing we're going to move on to is uh, our classroom factors. So we talked about all the things that could be happening with that child's development. And now we're going to talk about things like, are we having too high expectations for self-control? Do we have enough space in the classroom? Are children able to um, move around the classroom to get where they need? Can multiple children work in one area? Um, are there enough materials? Is there one, only one coveted yellow dump truck or do you have multiple of them? Are they experiencing way too many transitions? Can you cut any of those transitions out? I think we all know that transitions are a really tricky time for challenging behaviors. Um, is there too little order or predictability? Is there a lot of changes happening? You guys touched on that with um, your emotional development piece. Is it overstimulating? Is there a lot of noise? Is there background noise? Is there music playing all day long? Um, is there too much looking and listening? So what I often tell teachers is you have to engage on the floor with children. If you're standing up and you're kind of policing the room in order to supervise and monitor and make sure behaviors don't happen, that's when behaviors happen. If you're engaged and on the floor with the children and facilitating play, then they're engaged in what they're doing um, and you can be in close proximity. One of those things that's a big deal in my classroom is the noise factor. I noticed that one of our friends, when we first come in there in the morning and there's four friends, there's no behavior issues whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. The moment more friends come in and that noise level goes up, the behaviors start. What is the way to control the noise level? Or not necessarily control it, but what, what would you do? Would you control the noise level? Or what would you do with the kid? Like, which one would you do? I mean, I think it's really hard for, I think automatically when you walk into a preschool classroom, it's loud. Mm -hmm. um, and you really can't say, like, you have to quiet. Um, you know, that's, it's just not effective, and it, nor is it an appropriate expectation. But I think there is some things that you can do as far as um, decreasing the amount of stimulation. So if you do have background noise like music playing, I would shut that off. Use it very purposefully, like for nap time um, or group time, like if you're taking them out to do some motor skills, that kind of thing. But it might be too much in the classroom. Um, are there other pieces of the, of the environment that you can control for stimulation? So maybe turning down the lights and opening the blinds just to let natural light in instead of having fluorescence on. Because it could be a combination, it could be the noise level, but it could be a combination of other things. And all the overstimulation, especially if there's a sensory issue going on, um, could just be overkill for that particular child. Um, I also think that it's, um, that's a great, time to effectively use small group work. Um, so if you know that there are, um, and I get it, it's not like you can, in most places, classrooms, you can't just get up and take two children out, just maintain ratio or anything like that. But if you know that you have a child who, at a certain time of the day, when everybody's really amped up, has a hard time, maybe you take a small, a small group, even if that means 10, um, and go work on a That's different a idea and being able to change up their environment. I feel like we've all, 
again, I always like to relate it to being an, an adult because there's so many parallels. We're still people all the way through. I feel like that's the mutual respect part as well. Um, but I get overstimulated in some certain settings. A mall is my <laughs> least favorite place to be just because there's too much going on, lots of lights, lots of people, lots of sound. I, as an adult, can remove myself from that situation and make it um, and, and change that for myself. A, a four-year-old doesn't have that real control. I know a lot of places will also utilize like a calm down um, area of their classroom. That's, the di big thing is that's not a timeout corner. That's a quieter space, maybe something you have off to the side where maybe there's just some, some soft pillows and blankets. There's some books. There's a way to remove yourself from the classroom, even if you can't stand up and physically leave. Having, again, that power and control, that choice that you can make to help a child who is too stimulating um, can be effective as well. All right. So basically for this last portion of um, the workshop, we're going to kind of focus on those preventative strategies. So we talked about all the developmental things that go into challenging behaviors um, and uh, how we need to be supportive of those different developmental effects. And now here's some concrete examples of things we can do um, in terms of changing our environment, changing our curriculum, and our expectations, and just naturally being proactive. So things that we've already touched on many times, modeling appropriate behavior, effectively communicating with young children, um, and then teaching them those conflict negotiation skills. So the next few slides that we're going to go through are going to kind of hit on these different aspects of prevention strategies. Um, okay, so as far as the environment, we look at the environment in a couple different ways. So you have the emotional climate or the emotional environment as well as the physical environment. Um, so with that, there's that piece of creating those secure attachment relationships in your classroom. There is a kind of hierarchy of attachment. So obviously your primary um, you know, caregiver in the home is usually your attachment figure. So if it's your mom or your dad or your grandparent, whoever the primary person in your lives is. But what a lot of research has found is that there's a hierarchy in terms of um, when those children aren't with their primary attachment figures, they also form attachment relationships with their teachers as well. So they kind of form a hierarchy. So mom's my attachment figure or dad's my attachment figure. When that person's not around, Latoya's my attachment figure. Jennifer's my attachment figure, something like that. You spend a lot of time with these children. So creating kind of an emotional environment um, that promotes those caring relationships, that mutual respect that we talked about before. <clears throat> and um, that lawful climate. So do children understand what's expected of them? Um, I like to think about, we talked about those kind of three main rules in terms of it's not okay to hurt somebody else, yourself, or the environment. Um, but when you're thinking about classroom kind of rules, I know a lot of our preschool classrooms kind of talk about what, what their classroom rules are, um, whether it's no hitting or something like that. But I think we need to look at rules and think of them more in terms of guidelines um, because there needs to be some flexibility in rules. So yeah, it's never going to be okay to hit. Um, but I also think we kind of change our minds about what's inappropriate and appropriate in certain areas of the classroom. Um, so depending on their skill level and how long they've been doing it, here's a great example. We have these big wooden blocks downstairs. Um, and we kind of started off the building process with, and they're heavy, they're big, heavy blocks in our toddler rooms, um, infants and toddler rooms, and we would say, you can only build them three blocks high. Um, so it wasn't very high. We didn't want them to fall off of them. We didn't, you know, want anybody to get hurt. I mean, I've had them fall on my toe before. It hurts. Um, and then as their block building became more sophisticated, um, we changed that expectation for them. So it's really hard to call that a rule, only three blocks high, because that means there's no flexibility in the rules. So if you have guidelines for their behavior in your classroom, I think that's a really helpful way of looking at it. That sometimes those expectations are going to change, and then there are some things in your classroom that are going to be rules. Like it's never a choice to hit somebody else. It's never a choice to, um, 
you know, bite classroom. somebody. It's never a choice to run out of the classroom, that kind of thing. So you're going to have some rules that you can't be flexible on, but then the other ones I think it's important to think about as guidelines. But regardless, they need to have really clear um, expectations of them and understand that when you say it's not a choice to run out of the classroom, it's never a choice to run out of the classroom. When Emily's here, when Kristen's here, when Diane's here, when this person's here, that it's never going to be okay and it's very consistent. We talk about a lot in our classroom um, because we all know children. I'm going to go ask Kristen and if she says no, I'm going to ask everyone else until I get the answer that I received. So we make it a point to really model um, a very clear expectation, like Kristen said, but also backing up your coworkers with things like, my words are always going to be the same as Georgie's words, things like that, just so you can let them know that it's not just me wanting you to do something. This is how it works in this space. It's consistently going to work in this space and it works the same way with everyone. So then it's, it takes away a situation for a power struggle and it takes away a situation for a child to kind of make those uh, jumps around the spaces. Then it feels hard for another child. If I allow friends to jump on the couch, Kristen doesn't. So I'm letting this child, Kristen sees another child at a different time of the day and he's redirected and, but doesn't understand why the first child was able to do it. So just being consistent with those. If you do, especially in a preschool classroom where they are old enough at maybe at four and five years old to have, have those clear expectations and have things that are concrete, um, but making sure that there aren't a ton of them and that you're consistent and you're relaying to the children that it's consistent. And I think the other thing is um, trusting children to make good decisions, not going into the classroom with the expectation that children are going to misbehave and going to make bad choices all the time. Let them try and let them try multiple times. Um, I think that communicates to them that you know, you trust them that they're going to work in the sensory table without throwing it all over the floor. And you're going to give them multiple attempts at trying that before you set some kind of limit. And then the actual physical environment <clears throat> are the things like your room arrangement, um, how you're setting up furniture, um, consistency, accessibility, accommodation. So do you have multiple toys? Um, is the room set up in a way that um, allows children to work together? Can only one or two children be at the light table or the sensory table or in the writing center or whatever? Or can multiple children be in that space playing? Because children can't understand and learn how to work with other children and learn how to socialize if they can't work together. Um, so if they have to sit somewhere at a table and do a worksheet, hmm. they're learning how to do a worksheet or to copy something you know, wrote um, by themselves but they aren't learning anything about working with another person. I have an example of this just in my own classroom. Um, so obviously when you, you're first starting out, it was a long ways back and I had my first classroom that I was the lead teacher and I was going to set this up and blah, blah, blah. And the children would not, it was just laps, just running laps around the classroom all day. All these careful, they don't care that dramatic play I spent two hours doing it. was just a running idea. And so I felt like I spent my entire day redirecting from that choice or trying to find something new. And I had um, another teacher kind of come in because I, I just needed an observation. Can you help me look at my classroom and see what's different? And she kind of said, Emily, you've pretty much set up a track around your classroom. You have lots of ideas along the wall two ideas, bigger ideas in the middle, and a lane for everyone to run. And it was really hard for them to, why would they move off out of the middle of the classroom along a wall where there wasn't a whole lot of space to be working in between there when there's a big open space to be working? And I'm not kidding, I took a day to move some things around and it wasn't that I needed to rearrange my classroom or get all brand new uh, materials or buy new things, I needed to move a shelf out. I needed to move a table. And it changed the dynamic of the classroom. Just making those little changes um, can make such a big difference. Same thing if you have everything's being pulled onto the floor constantly. Well, do you have just 
barrels of ideas out that are so overwhelming that all they can really they really want to do is dump and fill are they really engaged with that idea is it just out to take a space on a shelf mm -hmm. so maria like when you were talking about the overstimulation thing mm -hmm. i think another good point there is like do you have spaces that are compatible next to each other so is your block space or your mat space if you have a gross motor space in your classroom is that next to your reading space or your writing space because chances are any careful, quiet, thoughtful work that's happening in that space is going to be disrupted by somebody jumping off the block saying, I'm Flash! <laughs> um, you know, or knocking <laughs> things off, you know, like shelves or crashing towers and that kind of thing. That play is going to be disruptive. And then that's going to cause behavior issues between children. So are those spaces compatible next to each other? So quiet spaces, reading, writing. Dramatic play can be, depending on the age. Um, are they doing dramatic play superhero or are they doing dramatic play baby play? Um, you know, those kind of areas are quiet and so you want to put them next to like a calm down space and quiet space and you want to keep your more active spaces next to each other. Um, accessibility. Nothing makes me crazier than when I go into a classroom to do an assessment or something and I say, where are your books? Oh, we keep them up here um, so that um, the kids don't rip them. <coughs> How do they read? Well, they just have to ask us for a book. You're setting children up for failure. One, you're communicating, one, I don't trust you with these materials. And two, they can't be independent. Um, you're setting yourself up for failure because you're adding the number of tasks to your list. If you have to get materials out for children to play and you don't have the expectation that they can just go to the shelf and say, oh, okay, well, I want to build with magnetiles today, so I'm going to take these off and I'm going to sit down and play. Children can guide their own behavior if we trust that they can do that. Um, and then um, a private and intimate spaces, I think, are important, too. Um, children really like to pair off, and um, that attachment relationship is important, and especially peers that influence positively on your behavior. I think small spaces, too, where they can have <coughs> privacy to, you know, a lot of times our toddlers want to sit inside their cubbies because it feels good to be tight in there and their friend's right next to them and they're having that kind of um, conversation one-on-one. -on -one. So thinking about creating some spaces like that in your classroom, too. Which can be a box. <laughs> and we had a box in my classroom that we cut some windows out of, so it wasn't just go in the box and we'll see you when you come out, you know. But, um, <laughs> but so it, it gave them a space where they could feel like they were off on their own. There was always a lot of like, they just found so many ideas to do. And it was really because they had that space to, f to work on their own and be imaginative and create play together without being super directed, but they could also kind of do it in their own little setting. That out here. So the next one um, is curriculum. So basically, the best discipline is a well-planned curriculum. <laughs> if your children are engaged, this is just an example of um, one of our curriculum guides. So if you've gone to school here, you can, do, or if you work here, then you can pass it along. <laughs> um, but our curriculum guide is linked to the early learning and development standards. Um, but really, truthfully, a good curriculum that uh, is meaningful, is integrated, so we're not drilling and skilling, mm -hmm. um, but we, there are certain goals we have for children. There are skills that children need to accomplish before they go to kindergarten, but integrating that naturally into your curriculum um, so that it's you know, still based on their interests. So you know, they have a certain, they need to count to you know, a certain number. How can you fit that into dinosaurs because that's what they're interested in rather than just drilling and skilling count to 10 or count to 14. So integrated, an integrated curriculum. The curriculum should be meaningful because children are going to engage and work on activities in the classroom if they're meaningful to them. If they are interested in it, if it um, has some connection to their daily life um, or to those interests, you're going to see a decrease in problem behaviors if, you are, if your children are engaged in the classroom. Um, limiting those transition times is really important. Um, and, you know, having play is a big part of that. So our curriculum is, you know, linked to the early learning and development standards. It's still play-based. 
Um, we still spend much of our day in play where teachers are facilitating um, activities in the classroom based on the children's interest in the different learning areas or centers in the classroom, um, all while kind of constructing knowledge with them. So letting them guide play and lead play um, and then facilitating um, and integrating some of those skill sets into the curriculum naturally and authentically. Um, so if your, your children are engaged um, in what you're doing and they have some decision making in what that curriculum is going to be, so if you've observed them and you know what their interest is, or if you are working with older children, even preschool children, I know our teachers often talk about like, so what do you want to learn more about? Or um, kind of engage them in certain questions um, to see where their interests might lead. Um, then they have um, invested in what that curriculum is going to be and then they're engaged in those activity areas and you're spending a lot more time facilitating play <laughs> in those areas and learning in those areas instead of just monitoring and policing and supervising. Um, I think one of the things that um, is most important to me other than obviously we want them to be actively engaged in their learning is that piece of making it meaningful to children so we don't just move on from an idea because it's Wednesday and that was Tuesday's idea. Um, if it's something that they're actively engaged in and on Tuesday we've spent so much time working carefully on one idea, why would I end that then the next day just because I needed to move on to a different idea? We're really charged with finding a way to integrate those ideas from the development standards because obviously those are deemed important, those are things we're accountable for, and those are things that we need to make sure that the children are learning. But if we are super, I think the one that's coming around, it's from my classroom, um, they probably spent four months on the book, We're Going on a Bear Hunt. Um, and I mean, and that's one story, but they were so engaged, and there's so many things that we could work through that we had a lot of science ideas. If you look on that curriculum guide, there's something about a bear in every section, whether it's cognitive, language. So it wasn't just reading that story then, it was we took a bear hunt around our school and we're looking for different ideas. We talked about different kinds of bears. We use those as counting ideas. We use them as social emotional ideas of talking about how the, um, the different feelings that the people in the story had. One of our little girls, <laughs> the funniest thing was at the end of the book, the bear is kind of walking away and it's just the end page. But we had an entire, uh, we developed an entire kind of um, interest in emotions, just talking about this bear being sad at the end of the book because he didn't catch and eat the people. But, <laughs> but we used just that small thing out of that book was probably another week's worth of engaging in social emotional topics. And if I, if at the beginning of that month you handed me going on a bear hunt and said, now um, teach your children about emotions out of this. Like that's maybe not something I would have thought of right away. It's, I, I wouldn't have seen it, but I built off, or we built off of the ideas of the children and it expanded it so much further than we ever would have taken it with me just if, with me and my co-teachers just sitting and typing ideas into the computer. Yep. Okay. So modeling, um, I'm just going to kind of breeze mm -hmm. through this one because we've talked about it a lot um, in this session. The one thing that I just do want to point out in terms of we've talked about modeling socially acceptable behavior in, in lots of different ways, um, but I think there's something powerfully effective about um, sharing your true feelings with children. So if you're frustrated, if you're angry, you don't have to yell. I would never encourage yelling, <laughs> um, but I think it's absolutely effective and appropriate to say, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling frustrated. I've given you multiple messages about dumping this stuff out of the sensory table and it feels like you're not hearing my words and you know, they match that facial expression. You, know, you don't have to scold them, you don't have to yell, um, but matching facial expressions with feelings. It's okay to feel frustrated. We are not all in a good place and feeling happy all the time. No, um, and that is okay. And, they, and then you're validating your own feelings and you're telling them it's okay to be angry when you're at school, to be frustrated, to be sad. Those are all valid emotions that everybody has and your teachers have them too. Moving on.
So as far as effective communication, same kind of thing we've talked about this, being really positive, telling children what they can do, um, what is acceptable behavior, giving them what they can do instead of what they can't do. Um, and then using those kind of I messages like, I feel frustrated um, or I feel angry because this. So you're stating what your feelings is, what your feelings are, what their behavior is that's unacceptable, and why you feel the way you do. Um, so really turning it and like, you own that problem. You don't like that he's hitting his friend. He does because it's getting him what he wants. Um, so I feel frustrated when you're hitting your friend. Look at his face, that hurts his body, you know, that kind of thing. So being really descriptive in your explanations and linking those emotions um, to their behavior to make that connection. I think the thing that um, is helpful for me here um, is that calm, neutral tone. Because if I have that reminder in my head all the way through the class, I'm a loud person in general. Uh, like, I almost guarantee I don't need this microphone for them to hear me just fine <laughs> in that video. Um, but when you're amped up in a situation, if you're not thinking about that, your tone may be conveying something very different than what your words are saying. So if you're letting them know that it's not a choice um, to be um, hitting a friend, or if you're just trying to help them in a conflict especially, but they can tell that you're worked up, they're not gonna be able to bring themselves down to that level that you're expecting out of them if I haven't done it myself. And, and it's also an effective strategy in just getting them to be able to communicate with each other. So if we're raised up and I keep lowering my tone and I'm talking very calmly, you have to focus in on what I'm saying so that you can, you can understand. So that brings them in and then they're able to focus a little bit better. And if I have that conscious reminder in my head of, hey, you, can, you certainly can project, project, you gotta make sure you bring it down and not letting that emotion show in your voice and still being authentic. You can say, I'm very frustrated. You can see on my face, I'm feeling really, really sad right now. You can tell that without letting that emotion convey in your voice and it can be, it can be more effective than just saying something. Um, so if you're working on those kind of skills of teaching them how to resolve conflicts and letting them experience conflict, they're two and a half. Um, in this video and they're already able to resolve conflicts. Not independent of adult, but I was in close proximity and facilitated, um, but I didn't have to separate them. They weren't clawing at each other as we were making the plan. So it is possible, but it's our job to help them develop those skills. If you wanted to skip the yeah. last video, that's perfect. Get to last um, so here's just a kind of putting it all into practice. I wanted to show you this video clip um, from, I don't know if you remember that show, I'm dating myself here, probably 15 years ago, um, The Super Nanny. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <laughs> here's an example of her, and I just want you to look at, like, how could this whole situation have been avoided? What did she need to know? Okay, so a couple of, couple of things happen in there. Um, so he is not three yet. That, that happens in way earlier. She explains the age of the child. What is she asking of that child who's not three? So the whole thing could be avoided if you weren't asking a two and a half year old to play Candyland. Children at three don't understand games with rules. Sometimes four and five year olds don't understand games with rules. They're far too sophisticated for them to understand what happens. So he was absolutely hitting the different things and throwing the pieces because he, he can't play Candyland. It's a developmentally inappropriate expectation. So there's the developmental effect. Then she, do, she does say some things like, get down on the child's level, always give a warning, but then she totally messes up the whole discipline situation by one, putting him on a naughty step. Does that link to our long-term goals? Is that forming positive self-concepts? No. You're asking a two and a half year old to reflect on their behavior. They can't do that either. Um, cognitively, it's far too advanced for them. Um, so I just like to link that um, with all the things that we talked about and the importance of looking at the developmental effects. That whole situation could be prevented just by not, by having developmentally appropriate expectations. 
But ultimately, even when you have the most developmentally appropriate expectations, you're still going to have classroom management issues. How you um, respond to those issues is just as important, being positive and linking that back to those long-term goals. We want them to self-regulate. We want them to have positive self-concepts. We want them to learn how to respect themselves, others, and the environment. Um, so if you guys can just, um, if you have any questions, certainly you can come up and ask us. If you can open up your folders, the survey is in there. Please fill that out so we know what types of professional development you would like to hear more of or what you thought about it. And then also, um, out on the table out there is something that looks like, let's see if I can find it here in this mess. There's a little brochure and it says PD workshops. So this is something new-ish that we're doing. We offer brown bag family workshops. They're free for families. They're an hour long. I do one on potty training. Um, there's one on social emotional development, I think. Um, so we have some practitioner workshops in there. We have research-based work workshops. So the practitioner workshops are like what you heard today or if you're here tomorrow as well. Um, we have a symposium on children in October. Um, so those are all things you can check out. Feel free to grab a brochure um, at the end um, on that table. And here is, um, like I said, upcoming events. Those are all located in those, that PD workshop brochure. You can uh, get information on us. We have a Twitter account. Um, this is our website, earlychildhood.ehe.osu.edu. All of our curriculum guides are on there. You can look at our website. You can look about things about our school, upcoming events, things like that. Thank you so much for attending. If you're coming back tomorrow, we're excited to get in, get in on the ABC charts and kind of strategies to use in the classroom um, that are effective for challenging behaviors, um, especially for those children that are um, exhibiting behaviors beyond your normal kind of tier one, tier two um, children.